Welcome again. Good morning. Uh, today we're into a, a new series. We're looking at uh, First Peter, so uh, glad that you're with us. And uh, we'll be taking some time to go th all the way through First Peter section by section, so that we have a better understanding of what's going on. And uh, I've been, I've put a title to this series: God's Message to the Isolated, which seems to make sense, since that's where the majority of us are uh, around the world at this point. So we are in weird and unusual times, that's for sure. Never have we had to be so isolated from one another on a global scale like we're doing at this time. At least not for this generation. There have been other uh, pandemics, other events that have kept people separated. Um, but this is definitely new for our generation and for this time and really to see it on such a global scale. So as I've been calling around to check in, the general comment is that it's time to get back to the way that things have been done. It's time to get back to the way uh, that we're used to. Life has to get back on track as we face the virus in different ways. And maybe we're moving that way in BC. Uh, we'll find out more in the next few weeks and we'll make adjustments as we can within the congregation to see how we can do that. We'll meet together as soon as we're able to in whatever size groups that we're able to. Uh, this week we're going to take communion at the end of the sermon instead of stopping at parts along the way like we did with the Names of God series. Our new series is a series through 1 Peter, so let me tell you why I'd like to, uh, why I picked this series, why I put this series together. As I tried to pick, pick a section of scripture that would be helpful for us to study as a congregation, something that would uh, connect to a majority of people in, in a variety of ways. So what passage do you go to? What section of scripture might you consider? Well, uh, really, 1 Peter made my short list pretty quickly, and, and here's a few reasons why. Why would we study 1 Peter? Well, you see this little slide here says, exiles with an unshakable hope. And that's kind of a theme that comes together in Peter that I thought we would connect with. So I want us to know the writing of 1 Peter within its context and in its entirety. We're going to be, we're going to be going through each text section section by section, as I think this is the best way to understand the original context of the book of the Bible. So we just go through one part after another, taking it in big enough sections to uh, maintain some flow, but also to see how every section connects one with the other. I want us to connect with the historical context of the writing to see that God has presented a message to those in isolation at other times in history, that his message is relevant today, uh, you know, when we're looking at isolation, really, this is not the only book that we could be looking at. We could be looking at Daniel, Ezekiel, Jonah, Malachi, or other writings from the time of the exile. We could be in Acts, from Acts chapter 8, verse 2, where the church is scattered. Uh, that's really the result of what we're going to be looking at. We could pick up the message from Hebrews, from Philemon, from 2nd, 3rd John, or even sections of Revelation. See, God always has had a message for the isolated, uh, a way for us to understand what God can do in times like this. There's another reason why I wanted us to take a look at 1 Peter. I want us to connect with um, the life of a disciple of Jesus is one of isolation. Really, that's one of the, the trademarks, one of the ways that we understand discipleship is to follow the leader, follow Jesus, and discipleship of Jesus often leads us away from the wide path of destruction, right? Narrow is the way, and wide is the way. Following Jesus leads us more towards isolation than it does to being encompassed by the group and the way that everybody else is moving. Christianity in itself is a faith that leads us away from the mainstream. So the, the message is true that we're in, whether we're in so, social isolation or not. The message of 1 Peter was written to people who were physically not isolated. Well, they were physically isolated as in they were separated from one another, but they weren't separated because of a pandemic. They were scattered and wondering if anyone else believed as they believed and they needed help to live a new life in a new way that was unsupported in their homes and unsupported in their communities. First Peter gives us a message of both connection and of hope. That even if you don't connect, because we usually don't in the world around us, uh, not that we're in total opposition of it, but there are ways that we're always a little bit on the outside. 
And a fourth reason that I'd like us to study 1 Peter is to see that each of the sections of 1 Peter, as I have divided them, they have a call to action. So I've chosen action words as reminders for each title of each sermon. This week is a call to praise, and each week we'll add another action. So in isolation, remember that we have a call to praise. So let's get into the context before we apply the text as we examine the call of praise in 1 Peter. We're only going to look at the first nine verses, although that does break up one sentence, but we'll get to that in a little bit. I want us to understand today really the importance of the context. I'm really seeing that this is written to a group in isolation. And what do we mean by that? Why are they in isolation and what's happened? What's the demographic of the group that we're writing to? So let's start with the context in this way. The tone of Peter. This is from the NIV Bible Commentary. It says, The tone of 1 Peter is a warm, fatherly one, full of encouragement. The exhortations are addressed to Christians who are scattered over a wide area, as it's written to provinces instead of towns or specific people. We have a number of uh, New Testament writings that are written to individuals, and we have ones that are written uh, to churches that meet in a certain area. But this is written to, to God's elect, strangers in the world throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And you see those names coming up on here, Bithynia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, we, they're big areas. They're provinces instead of just the towns that are within them. It's not a letter to Pisidian Antioch and to Pergamon, to Thyatira. It's written to areas that are a significant distance away from Jerusalem, too. So that's important. The writing may be to the Jews, or converts to Judaism as proselytes. These are people that may have come from uh, to Jerusalem for Passover and heard the gospel message by Peter in Acts chapter 2. Because that speaks of those that heard the, the message in their language groups and how it connects to the map that we were just taking a look at. This is about 30 years or so uh, after the Acts 2. And so whether this is Jews that came, to, um, came into Jerusalem or they were converted Jews, proselytes that go back to their pagan area, either way, the people that we're looking at that are reading 1 Peter are lot, most likely uh, the proselytes, those that have been converted out of paganism into Judaism. So now 30 years or so later, persecution comes to them because of their faith. The recipients didn't fit in when they left paganism to Judaism. They didn't fit in with the Jews who didn't treat them with full acceptance. The Jews who did not accept them may not have accepted their, their turn to Christianity. And their pagan families may wonder what is next. How long are they going to hold this belief? If they've gone from paganism to Judaism to Christianity, well, what's the next thing that's coming along that you'll tell us that is important for us to put our belief into the scattered believers need to connect with one another because they don't really connect anywhere else. Their faith has led to isolation with a few believers scattered far apart. The reason being um, they need to connect to one another because they're spread out through these provinces rather than writing to individual towns or areas. That's the context of First Peter, that isolation. People that don't fit in because of their faith. That's why it relates to every time in every generation. People that don't fit in because they're following Jesus. What's God's message to the ones that don't fit in and then are persecuted because of it? Well, Christianity leads to some opposition. Instead of talking about what they're facing to begin with, he talks about what they have in common. The truth is that they shared a common faith with Christians everywhere and faced common problems. Following Jesus doesn't relieve us from difficulty. Uh, following Jesus sometimes brings extra or a different type of difficulty. Simplifies life in some way, so there's some areas that we're not going to get into, uh, but it does bring another level of difficulty too. 
Their basic problem was to live for God in the midst of a society ignorant of a true God. That's what makes the writing timeless. Living for God in the midst of a society that's ignorant of a true God or even opposing a true God. Because they were Christians, they were misunderstood and subjected to cruel treatment. Peter's pastoral purpose was to write to these early believers to see their temporary sufferings in light of the full and coming eternal glory. In the midst of their discouragement, the sovereign God would keep them and enable them by faith to have joy. Jesus Christ, by his patient suffering and glorious future, had given them the pattern to follow and also a living hope. Life in a pagan society was difficult and required humility and submission. The immediate future for the church was an increase in the conflict with the world, as it says in chapter 4, 7 through 18. But God would provide the grace to enable the community of the faithful to grow into maturity. They must help one another, and they must show loving concern for the members, in, lest, or just in case, or when it comes, because the flock could be injured. Chapter 4, verse 8 4, verse 10, and 5, 1, and 2, that uh, damage and struggle is coming. First Peter deals with faithfulness and core beliefs of a Christian. It provides the information to an audience with the problem. The Gentiles and scattered Jewish Christians are having difficulty fitting in. They are different from those around them, and some people are taking notice, and they don't like it. So... They want them to fit in. They don't want them to cause problems. They don't want their morals to speak against their pagan practices or even their Jewish practices. One person in particular that has taken notice and begun to do something with these people is somebody we know from history, the person with a problem that is going to bring conflict in, that is going to say, I don't like these people, is the fifth Roman emperor. The emperor born... Uh, AD 37. He commenced his reign in 54. He died June 9th, 68. Here's somebody that we know quite a bit about in history, a pretty good record, and that is the Emperor Nero. The first years of Nero's reign were peaceful. Paul, in compliance with his own expressed appeal in Acts 25, was asked to be brought before the Caesar, and that Caesar's probably Nero. He was brought before Nero as the reigning Caesar around 63 AD. We may infer that Paul was freed of all charges and continued his labor of evangelization because Nero at that time wasn't really against everything. But the cruelty of Nero began in his second period after he married his wife, Popeia. During the period, he killed his mother, his chief advisors, Seneca and Burrus, and many of the nobility to, sec to secure their fortunes. When Rome was damaged by fire, he blamed the Christians and began persecuting them. History tells us that he finally died by his own hand in the summer of AD 68, the last of the line of Julius Caesar, and both Paul and Peter suffered martyrdom under Nero. That gives us a context. That's who's opposing and how strongly that opposition is coming. Now, they're uh, a little distance away from Rome, so it's going to take a bit of time for it to get to them, but it's going to get to them before it even gets to, Jew uh, to Jerusalem. So that's the context of the text. Let's get into the text. So what are these isolated Christians supposed to do to remain faithful while under opposition? That's the call to action. The first call to action, what do you do under opposition? What do you do in isolation? Is praise. The first thing that he calls them to do is praise. So our text, 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9, page 1886, 87, if you're following along in the Blue Bible. So here's the text as it's laid out, the first two verses. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and then notice how he refers to his audience. To God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkled by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. So take note of the terms of inclusion and unity as a help to see themselves as God sees them instead of how they might feel about themselves. We know that it's by Peter. Peter says so, an apostle, that is one sent out by Jesus Christ. But the focus here is on the audience. He calls them elect, even though 
they're Gentiles, even though they're uh, probably of a pagan background. He calls them strangers, pilgrims, or sojourners, chosen, sanctified, those who have been made holy and set apart, set apart, chosen to be obedient and cleansed with the blood of Jesus. And that's in the image of Hebrews 10:22 and 12:24. Those that have been sprinkled by His blood, purified in that sense. God calls them to see their unity instead of their division and separation, and He offers the blessing of grace getting the good things that you don't deserve, and peace with Jesus as our Yahweh Shalom. Let's not forget those things. Yahweh Shalom, who gives us peace with God, peace with one another, and that inner peace during our time of turmoil. So it really is an affirming um, view of themselves. Here's how God sees you. You might see yourself as people that nobody cares about, people that... Uh, that nobody trusts, people that don't fit in, but when God sees you, he sees you as elect, strangers in the world, scattered, but you are chosen, and uh, you've been sanctified because you've been sanctified for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Now the next section, uh, verses 3 through 12, is all one sentence in Greek, but we're going to stop at verse 9, it begins with a call to action for those that are in isolation. Instead of focusing on the problem, we focus on God, and that always leads us to praise. Praise for many reasons. Starts with, here's how you think of yourself, and all of this is true. These changes in self-view are because of who God is, the first uh, verses 3 and 4. So as Peter thinks about uh, the changes in their lives, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. We praise the God and Father of Jesus, a God of mercy who does not give us the punishment that we do deserve. Instead of punishment, he gives us a new birth as born-again Christians, a new birth into a living hope, not an inactive one, a living hope, a hope that continues to grow and to mature, and that hope is tied to the resurrection of Jesus. Everything that we have is because of Jesus' resurrection. In verse 4, he speaks of the reasons to praise God and that is for our inheritance. This is an inheritance that can never, never, ever, never perish, spoil, or fade. And the reason it can do that is because it is kept in heaven for you. The inheritance is protected. Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 24 reminds us of that. They're all good reasons to praise God and to accept the salvation that Jesus offers so that we can be in heaven. We can be with that inheritance. We can be uh, in heaven because of Jesus. So, praise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, our new birth, the living hope, the resurrection of Jesus, because of this inheritance. Verse 5 continues the discussion. Who through faith are shielded by God's power. God's, God secures this inheritance. Who through faith are shielded by God's power. Until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be, to be revealed in the last time. It is a salvation that is to be revealed in the last time. You don't get it now only later, so you have to trust, you have to wait. In this, the fact that we and our inheritance are shielded and we're kept to the last day, in this you greatly rejoice, but what we do have during our, re our rejoicing is some trials. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials doesn't overlook their immediate context, but he speaks to it and say, it says, although we're shielded and although this will come in the future, in the present things might not be pleasant. In the, in the present you are facing difficulty. But that doesn't negate the truth of the future either. And then comes verse 7. 
God can bring good out of these as well. These, these trials have come so that your faith, your faith of greater worth than gold, she wants them to think of the eternal over the temporary, your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, because gold does, you can heat it too much and it evaporates. Your faith may be proved genuine and may result in Praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Not now, but later. Have to hold on all the way through, and then at the end, uh, it may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. That gets him thinking about Jesus. And so verse 8 and 9, we continue. Talking about Jesus. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are currently receiving the goal. The goal is what you would expect to see at the end. The goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You are already saved. Eternity starts here. You're receiving what you will get, what will be finalized, what will be completed because of Jesus, because even though you haven't seen him, you know that you do love him, and that fills us with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Uh, something that the world doesn't understand, but a joy that we can share even in trials, even in isolation. So that's the text. The first message to the isolated is to focus on praise. Only God can bring good out of the struggles that we face, and we do see that in our current isolation. God, can, God has blessed our congregation. God has blessed our congregation with health and safety, with interconnection, with purpose, and the ability to be a blessing to each other, and we've still been able to be a blessing to the community. We can't handle everything, but we can help a few. We have ways to communicate with one another as well as to share commun communion in a different way and in thought of one another. We are separated, but we're not alone. Oh, and that's the reason to connect with one another. For these reasons and many more, God is deserving of our praise. And so we focus on praising him this week. The call to action is praise. What are some of the things that we can praise God for this week? Well, I think praise God in thanks. Instead of looking at the, the struggles, the difficulties, we think of all of the good things that are still going on. We thank God for his written word, that we can have time in a book like First Peter, like we did the names of God, but we have time to be in God's word and the blessing of that. Thank him for Jesus' willing sacrifice. You notice how the first section is so much about what Jesus has done and how his life, uh, death, burial, resurrection impacts us. We thank him for our connection to one another, that we are not alone, that although we might even be scattered, uh, we can think of others in other provinces, not just even in our own congregation. We thank him for our health and our safety because if it changes, it changes, but we thank him for what we have at this point. We can be uh, in thanks to God for a variety of things. Another one, look for the good that God can bring out of the isolation. That's a focus instead of complaint. Look for the benefit. Look forward to being back together, and we will be back together. We'll make the adjustments as we can. Take time to smell the roses. Well, my roses aren't up, but my tulips are just starting to. Take time to smell the roses or tulips. Settle down and enjoy God's little and large blessings. Take time every day to enjoy the moment. Just be at peace, and it makes a difference. First Peter is a wonderful, thought-provoking, faith-developing book. First Peter reminds us that we're strangers and pilgrims who are different than the world around us and that it's okay. It's a reminder that that's the norm, not the exception. Christ still needs to be preached and we still need to be strangers. Amen. Christ needs to be preached and we still need to be strangers. We can't fit in completely or we lose our influence. 
that's the sermon part. But those thoughts, I've put the communion at the end because all of those thoughts lead us to praise, lead us to understanding who God is. And as we share communion this week, we can think of the many concepts brought up in the passage. We might think of ourselves as being chosen by God or strangers in the world who don't fit in or the living hope or the inheritance that we have as well as the many other reasons for praise. Our mind might go towards those and that's good. But for me, I wanted us to think of verse 7. Verse 7 says that our faith is of more value and longer lasting than gold. That idea of the eternal over the temporary and to have a mindset of that, I think, is of value. Starting the week off with communion is a reminder of the value and timelessness of the relationship that we have with Jesus. Not just with Jesus, but because of Jesus. The value of that relationship is far surpassing anything else that the world has to offer. Everything else will perish. But our faith, our faith goes with us to eternity. So as we share communion this morning, let us think of how precious our faith is and how eternal it is. How the future is so much outweighs the present. Our trust in Jesus leads us to accepting the inheritance that he has provided and that he is protecting in heaven. So today we're going to have a prayer for the bread. Take a moment as you share that, uh, pause the video, and then come back and we'll have a prayer for the grape juice and then a short word of conclusion. Let's go to God in prayer for the bread. Heavenly, holy, righteous, and loving Father, we come to you to break bread in remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. We are thankful for his body and the example that he set for us about the priority of connecting with you and being born again. We are thankful for the church family when we pray for our protection and focus as we look to you and serve you however we can this week. We thank you for the talents and gifts that you give us to serve one another as a body and for the bread that reminds us to value the eternal over the temporary. We break this bread together in celebration of Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our prayer for the grape juice. Our most high God and Father who sustains us, protects us, and gives us peace, we come to you with this prayer of thanks for the grape juice that we're that we share, thinking about the sacrifice of Jesus and the blessing that we receive because of his resurrection. We know that our faith is precious and help us to protect it and nurture it this week as we spend time in your word and in prayer. Help us to praise you in all cir circumstances and situations as we look forward to being with you in heaven one day. As we, sh as we share this juice, we think of the blood that Jesus shed and the forgiveness of sins that it provides. And we're thankful for choosing us adopting us and giving us purpose. We thank you for the day and for the week ahead if you, decide, if you decide to provide us with that. And if you decide to send Jesus back to get us, may we be found ready and working in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer and share this grape juice as an isolated family of believers. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Thank you for being together today. May you be richly blessed this week as you focus on the eternal over the temporary and find new things to praise God for each day. Keep safe, keep connected, keep focused in God's word. Think of all the ways and the things that we can praise God for. What a blessing it is to serve him and to live for him and to look forward to his coming again. May you be blessed this week and a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, we offer all things, and uh, we just look forward to, uh, to bringing him praise and glory through the week.